we're in a social media recession. Do you know anyone who's like, I need to follow more people? Everyone is like, it's too much. If you want to set yourself apart, you have to niche down from the start. People don't want to do that. For anybody who's like thinking all views are equal, they are not. If you want to be known, you have to double down on one thing. And if you don't pick one, you won't become known. I think the real play is understanding What's up, Wealth Builders? Today, I got a great guest on. This person has become an eight-figure entrepreneur online social media. In fact, she is an Instagram expert. She is a top podcaster, over 90 million downloads on her podcast. She's also done a ton of other cool stuff like beach body products. If you remember P90X back in the day, I know I was doing it. And she was at the forefront of many fitness endeavors like that. I got none other than Shailene Johnson. What's up? What's going on? Great thanks to for, be here. Thanks for coming to Vegas. Thank you so much. Yes, appreciate it. You know, it's um, we have so many friends in common, and so it's a real honor to be here. Yeah, I love getting you know the people that have been in. You know, I, I call it the digital marketing space. Yeah, because I'm so new to it. I know. Um, you know, I came up as an athlete, real estate guy, and so like digital marketing is all new to me in the last couple of years. Shocking. Yeah. Like when I started digging into your background and realized like this is less than three and a half years. Mm -hmm. That's got to be super inspirational to people who are like, am I too late? No. Yeah, they're definitely not too late. Right. So let's talk about that because you've been in this space before there was even social media, right? Dude, I mean, right? I know. <laughs> yeah. That's that's why it was uh, uh, really important that we had good lighting today. <laughs> yeah. So we made sure the lighting was on point. Yeah. Um, you brought just the full on crew. Oh, like, glam squad. It looked like, you know, what they do in Hollywood. Oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have a J-Lo reputation now. No, it was great. So, you know, I think a lot of people and you you teach social media and building mm -hmm. businesses and everything online. You know, we were just talking about offset that it's actually easier than people think. Mm -hmm. Most people overcomplicate it. Yeah. Why yeah. do you believe that? Well, because it's always changing. Right. And people are always they're so busy paying attention to what everybody else is doing and trying to gamify that and, and, and so much copycatting and overwhelming themselves with, am I doing this the right way mm -hmm. and overproducing things? And I, I really just think that if we think about what it is that resonates with us, you don't have to worry so much about the algorithm. Like, just stop, stop trying to figure out the algorithm. Just figure out yourself. Like, what feels believable to you? What do you like? What does it turn off to you? What grabs your attention? And so I, I think that's a big piece of it. I think that social media in general, people don't realize before there was social media. Like, when I had to promote a business of mine, like one of my first businesses was um, a used car lot. Mm. And there was no social media. So I had to print out flyers at Kinko's mm -hmm. and go to like very busy shopping centers and put flyers under windshield wipers until a manager would run out and say like, what are you doing? We're going to call the police and I have to remove every single flyer. Yep. You know, it was like one car at a time. And now if you just create and consistently create, you're going to reach for free hundreds of thousands, maybe. Yeah maybe a million like it's and you used to be you didn't know very many people who went viral now like everyone has a viral for them piece of content yeah i got five thousand views on this it's crazy right yeah it's funny because i tell that to people too i'm like hey look look at social media as just part of your marketing budget right your business has a marketing budget maybe you used to cold call maybe you used to <laughs> put out flyers right, right? That's no different, right? You're gonna have to invest to create content. And you know, it could be money, it could be sweat equity of, hey, I'm gonna go out and just film myself and edit myself and whatever. But there is no form of marketing that I'm aware of that lets you do it for free with no limit. And you could just post as many times you want and they'll just keep it there forever. Yeah. It's crazy. It is really crazy. And there's so many creative outlets. There's so many different platforms. You don't have to make all of them work. I and mean, if you can get one of them to work just by focusing on one, you, you, it's an incredible opportunity to just reach all the people you're trying to reach and then some. So what would you say is your one? At least initially, yeah. I know you start with one yeah. and then you kind of like start expanding. But what was your one? Initially, Instagram. Instagram. Percent, yeah. So when did you get started? Um, when Instagram first launched and, and then I really focused only on fitness once I, and I was only posting fitness content because at the time that was, 
my main business model. When I left the fitness industry and decided to focus on business building, um, you know, building online courses, th- that sort of thing. Then I stopped entirely posting any fitness content, but I still had this huge following who were suddenly no longer interested. Mm -hmm. So I saw this like deep dip in my views, et cetera, but I needed to do that. And I understood that, that I was going to lose a certain percentage of my audience yeah, and that I was going to relate to a certain percentage who were like, oh yeah, I'm into fitness and I'm into this. Um, But you have to be prepared for that. And I think when you are, when you're building a brand or when you're changing your brand or when you're transitioning your brand, you, you have to make it really clear to people and you kind of have to double down, even though your ego says, oh, but this kind of content gets me more views. likes and views. Yeah. yeah. I tell people that too. I'm like, Hey, would you rather have a million views of like random people? Right. Mm-hmm. Cause you made a funny video or whatever the case is, or would you rather have call it 20,000 views of the exact person your business can service that piece of content. I'm like, dude, the right views, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think we are so just conditioned to want to get all the likes and the views. And with so many of my students, they'll have this like super viral piece of content that just relates to nothing, (laughs) you know, and it, it just attracts the wrong type of the riffraff exactly and then they kind of get stuck there yeah so if you're catering to the algorithm for vanity metrics Mm -hmm. it won't help your business it could hurt your business yeah you know what's funny i I haven't talked about this yet but um you know this guy made a viral video Uh about how you know he bought one of our programs he wanted a refund we offered him a partial refund because we fulfilled all these services for him etc and um you know he ended up not wanting to do it right and he lied about the video and it was just like this whole stupid thing Mm. but you know i started talking to him directly Mm -hmm. and i said hey you know you can say whatever you want my life ain't gonna change one bit in Mm -hmm. fact more people will become aware of me and i don't really care like it's all good and i go but here's the thing this viral video that's probably your best video ever to this point Guess the type of people that it attracts. Do you think that any of them are going to buy anything from you? Or are they just people who like drama, who got nothing going on with their lives, who are probably just losers? And you're going to just, you know, th- that g- good luck if that's who you want. I'm glad you brought that up. Like, that, this is something that drives me crazy. It, and it, it's really popular on YouTube, especially, and TikTok. It's um, a creator whose niche is tearing down Drama. other people like yeah. it's you know or like tearing down certain industry and it's there's you know the anti mlm the anti sales the anti personal growth the anti uh crime podcast the anti like list the industry there's somebody who all they do is make anti content mm-hmm. and i always think the same thing too like what wh- wh- what are you creating like wh- who are you attracting yeah i almost feel like it makes people who are like uh, a little bit afraid to put themselves out there Th- that if you dial into that type of content, it'll just make you smaller. Oh, for sure. Because it makes you think like, oh, someone's going to make anti content about me. Well, they're not going to make content about someone who they don't know. Exactly. If you're not making an impact, no one's making any content. Yeah. You don't so, got to worry about haters if no one knows you. Well, and it's like, uh, <laughs> I'll give a funny story about this. So, you know, before social media, the anti content, I would say would be like, trash tv you know so one example would be jerry springer right okay the type of person that watches jerry springer is probably you know not the most sophisticated person in the world um and so guess what right like advertisers know that if they're going to go market to jerry springer well when i started running tv commercials to buy people's houses okay my ad buyer was like, hey, we're gonna put you on all these channels and stuff. And I'm like, all right, whatever you guys think. I, you know, I don't run TV commercials, like whatever. And th- you know, the thing we're running an ad for is, hey, we wanna buy your house, we'll pay you all cash, et cetera. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole premise is, yeah, you're not gonna get the highest price. We gotta make a profit and make a deal, but you're gonna get convenience, you know, if you're in foreclosure, whatever, right? Right. Guess what channel provides the highest ROI for us? It's yeah. Jerry Springer. Yeah. Because the type of people who watch Jerry Springer. Is that show still in the air? Dude, Maury, Jerry, yeah. you know, all the same crap, right? Yeah. It's like that type of content attracts 
the type of person who's probably in a bad spot yep. who needs to take cash and whatever else. And it's like, it just is what it is. Yeah. So, you know, on social media, for anybody who's like thinking all views are equal, they are not. They're not, no. And it's the community that you're building, right? I think for so many people, again, they're afraid to put themselves out there because they want to be perfect. They think it needs to go viral. They're not truly being authentic because they're looking at other people's content and impersonating it. Yeah. Um, I think that's much harder to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's becoming white noise. Like, I mean, I teach Instagram. We've got a, you know, Instagram membership community, but I can't stand the content. I see most of the content yeah. I see on Instagram. Why not? What, like what, what kind of content are you seeing that you don't like? It's just so it all looks the same, you yeah. know? And uh, I think, so I've got a podcast too, and it's a video podcast. And one of the things I'm trying to figure out right now is like, I don't want to just repurpose clips from my podcast. Cause I, I'm not interested in seeing those anymore with the same font and the same graphics and the mm -hmm. same edits. And they all are, you know, copying each other. Yep. So I, it doesn't feel like anyone standing out. Yep. So like, you know, that's something we're really trying to figure out. Like how do we, how do I create the kind of content I want to see? Mm -hmm. Cause it's not on Instagram. So, you know, that's, it's a tricky thing. I, I don't, I, I don't think Instagram, I don't think TikTok is worried about Instagram. I think TikTok is looking at like Netflix. You know what I mean? Mm. I think people stay on that for so long. Right. And, I, but I think Instagram is like always looking at TikTok. And well, so Facebook's always looking at everyone and like, true. we just copy everyone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that there's, um, I think to get ahead of the game, you have to stop looking at what everyone else is producing and, and pay attention to what you find captivating. Not what you find highly polished, but like, what do you find captivating? Right. You know? And I, th I think that's a lot of story. I think it's less produced. Mm, I think that was the to raw. Yeah, I do. I think that was the trend I saw in infomercials. Like I was like, when we were at the height of creating infomercials for TV, I was like, I, all these infomercials are so cheesy. They're making me lactose intolerant. They're so like, no one talks like that. No one sits in an audience applauding. Like, what is this? Yeah. Like, and I want, I want to reach my girl and she's got, you know, radar for cheesy, inauthentic stuff too. So like, why would we, why are we producing cheesy, inauthentic, phony stuff? Mm -hmm. She, that's not interesting to her. Yeah. Like she wants real. And so, you know, at the time I just convinced my partner, uh, which was beach at the time, I said, L let me just use my phone. Like, let the, I don't want a script. I don't want, uh, you know, anyone there doing my hair and makeup. I want to be like, just on my phone, talking to my girl and um, make it real and raw. So it feels like a FaceTime. Yeah. And they were like, oh, you know, well, sure. We can try We can test it because there's certainly no cost involved in that. And, you know, it, it worked. And that was. I think when you started to see a lot of companies switching to user generated content and sometimes they, they do the stuff that it's supposed to look like you filmed on your phone, but like the real stuff is what people want. Mm -hmm. We trust it. I think the more highly produced something is, the more we go like, wh why does it have to be so produced mm -hmm. to ke keep my attention? Yeah. It used to be you wanted like a movie trailer. Yes. Type commercial dude right yes and now you would see that and you'd be like okay i'm watching an ad like that the main thing is like you don't even realize it's an ad mm -hmm. it's just a great piece of content and then all of a sudden at the end it's like oh i could actually learn more about this or buy this or it's know. true i mean like when i see ads I, I mean i can tell something's an ad whether yep. it's you know on instagram or youtube or whatever whatever platform um i i just i tune away you want to hear something funny like the YouTube yeah. ads? So somebody was telling me about a strategy. They're like, hey, you know, what we started doing was like just scripted podcasts that are ads. And so like what ended up happening was these guys, like all of a sudden it would play like it was just the, the next episode on YouTube, oh. but it was an ad and people find themselves watching this hour long podcast. That's really just an infomercial or an ad, but it's so, you know, you know, it's like a really good webinar, essentially, mm -hmm. but it's scripted like a podcast. Well, it looks and feels like a podcast and you're just going through and you're like, 
thinking you're just watching a normal episode. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. If you're watching this show, my guess is you're probably an entrepreneur who's trying to grow your business. And for me, the best thing I ever did to grow my business was build my personal brand on social media. It's allowed me to get more revenue. It's allowed me to raise more capital and it's allowed me to hire better talent. And if you are not currently creating content for your brand, you're missing out and your competition is. So if you want to learn to grow, my advice is to create a podcast. Now there's a lot that goes into building a podcast and why I believe it's the best way. So I've actually created a free training that I want you to go check out. If you go to panadamedia.com slash podcast, you can go access the free training right now and see how a podcast is going to be the best decision to grow your personal brand today. So go check it out by clicking the link below and I'll see you in the training. Interesting to me, which I'm really trying to figure out right now, is the type of content that I see, at least my audience, gravitating towards what I would call keep me company mm. content. Okay. Like long form where I'm I need to organize my closet and I need to I'm doing things but I want to just have a conversation in the background. It's like somebody keep me company. It's also multitasking. Yeah. And, you know, maximizing your workout or your cleaning or your drive. So something that happened very interesting to us this year on my podcast. So the podcast we started, I don't know, hundred years ago, but um, is it too late to start a podcast? <laughs> no, it's not. Everyone and their brother has a podcast, but you need to know if you should and why. Okay. Because if it's because you're trying to grow your business and you're trying to grow your brand, I would say get on a podcast. Don't try to start a podcast. Like get on podcasts. Learn how to become a great podcast guest. Mm -hmm. get, like just get on a million other people's podcasts. You're going to get far more reach and grow your brand. Grow. It's just yeah. exponentially. If you want to start a podcast because you're my dad and you want to just like tell stories and have a place for them to be kept. Okay. That's a different motivation. So I think you have to know your motivation. Mm -hmm. I, I do think a lot of entrepreneurs say, well, I want to, I want to be Ryan mm -hmm. in five years. So he's got a podcast. I need to start a podcast. He's, you know, they, they do all the things you are doing, but they don't realize when you started and that you have a motivation behind you. You have an intention behind it. You have so many other pieces. So for most entrepreneurs, I think they get excited to do everything they see someone else doing, but they often do things in the wrong order. Yeah. Yeah. And also, too, like you mentioned, they're kind of late to the game, right? Because you just said you've been podcasting for, I don't know, you know, really long time. Yeah. You know, and so for me, I've been podcasting for I think this is going to be the third year. Uh huh. So it's like, yeah. I mean, it was a wise decision three years ago to start this, and now podcasting's bigger than ever. But dude, you and, were late to the game. And I was late. And I still Yeah, don't but look where you are. Yeah. And I tell people this all the time as entrepreneurs, I believe anyways that a podcast is the best way to get started. Mm. And I, I agree full heartedly with How you. come? Well started I, with what? If you're gonna start making content today. Mm. Um, I believe it's the best for multiple reasons. One is efficiency. So it's like, all right, yeah, you can repurpose and do all the things. So you it. mean specifically a video based podcast? Correct. Gotcha. OK, Correct. big distinction. Yep. So you can get all this repurposed content. Number one. Number two, you get all the relationships that come from it. Uh, number three, it's the easiest way to build trust with an audience. Like you said, video you know, productive people are doing productive things. Mm -hmm. So they don't have time to go watch a Mr. Beast video or right. even reels. You can't do that while you're doing things. So true. So you're getting this That's this so avenue true. of, you know, time spent with you. And what's the number one way that people spend money with you is they spend time with you. Trust. Right. Right, right, right. So a podcast is the only thing that's long form in that manner. Um, a podcast is the only thing that's natural. It's just a conversation. Mm. You know, you go try to teach someone to make reels right now. <laughs> it's just like, oh my gosh, dude, like, right. that's terrible. So it's natural. Um, Should then, be. Yeah. And then I would say the fifth thing is, you know, at the end of the day, um, my buddy Neil Patel actually said this. And he's great. He's great. And I, I, he tweeted it the other day and he was like, hey, think about this. Should you start a podcast or should you do? Um, I forgot what his other alternative was, but he basically compared one thing and said, you know, per American, there are this many of that. I can't remember what it was, though. Uh -huh. um, but the other one was, hey, 
per American, there are this many podcasts. And it was drastically like undersupplied. So even though we think there's all these podcasts out there, it's still so undersupplied yeah. relative to how many Americans there are. Well, you know, had you asked me about a video podcast, I think my answer would be different. Okay. And so we had just done an audio podcast for like 10 years. Oh. And then it was just um, coming up on a year ago that I decided, convinced by our friend Sean Cannell, mm -hmm. uh, to do to make my podcast a video podcast. And I'm yeah. like, I just, it's so easy to just film or to record at 11 o'clock at night. I don't have to have my hair and makeup done, yeah. no lights, blah, blah, blah. But he's like, Shirley, that's where people are finding podcasts is on YouTube. The clips. The clips and you're, you're a, a video girl, like you love video. I'm like, you're right. Okay, I'll do it. And so we did, we switched to straight up video podcasting and such a, great move i'm so happy we did it however um it it's taken a little weird figuring out period because i started then catering to what was popular on youtube versus what i knew my audience liked yeah right so then i was like oh wow this video really popped off let's do this topic again yeah. whereas when i was just doing an audio podcast i would just never do whatever you want yeah you care. and i I always did this uh, one episode a week. I would just call it like ADHD ramblings. Like you're just, I'm telling you about my week. I'm giving you my opinion on things. It's all over the place. I lose my train of thought, all those things. And I would just like ramble on for like 40 minutes. Well, no one is searching for what is Shalene Johnson rambling on about today? You know, so like those videos did horrible on YouTube. So then I stopped creating that podcast mm -hmm. and started going like, okay, what topics should I do? And my community kept saying something's changed like i used to feel like you were keeping me company and now i feel like you're always teaching me something and i just want to hang out with you mm. so i i met this like place in the road where i'm like okay but that type of content doesn't help me find new followers new yes subscribers but it does allow me to go much deeper with the ones that i have but i still think you can find new subscribers even with that yeah, because I, I think about, you know, the way I explain podcasting to people is, OK, podcasting, you think of it as being this 10 year old thing. OK, mm -hmm. it's not. People have been podcasting the last hundred years. The radio shows were podcasts. True. Yeah. Right. When uh, I watch Sports Center and they're just talking about all the games and BS and back and yeah. forth and arguing. Yeah. They're just podcasting. Yeah. You know, like when I look at. Fox News and CNN and these guys just going back and forth, they're just having a podcast. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and if I look at uh, even like 50 years ago, The Tonight Show, they're interviewing the celebrity. Yeah. It's a podcast. Yeah. So like yeah. this this idea of humans just BSing. Having conversations. Works. Yeah. It's worked a hundred years yeah. and it will, people sitting around the campfire podcast. Mm -hmm. So it's for sure going to last forever and it's not changing. People like to just talk i agree and it isn't too late because especially for women who are my age or like over 40 oh they're way underserved they're way underserved yeah. they're they we've got the most disposable income you know mm. and we are easily influenced by people who we see as wise you know i think one of the hardest things for me having been in an entrepreneur for so long and to see all these, you know, young kids who pop up and they're suddenly the authorities. And I'm like, I just don't buy it. Like, <laughs> what do you, you know? you're, you're, you're a newborn baby. Like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? Yeah. And so they just don't have the same kind of credibility yeah. with a demographic that's over 40. PR agencies, um, marketing firms, people who look for influencers, they are looking for influencers. And I even hate to use the word influencers because a woman over 40 has a negative association with that word. Mm. Uh, but they're looking for people who have an opinion and are wise and they want, they're, they're looking for them to, to be spokespeople. They're looking to them to put advertised dollars into their content because they have influence over the people who have money. So if somebody's watching this right now and they don't have the credibility, should they create content? Um, tell me what you mean specifically by that. They think they don't have the credibility. They don't have the credibility because they haven't put in the time. Why aren't they credible? 
Um, let's just say someone truly isn't um, that credible yet, right? Okay, let's just take, since we're using women as an example, um, I don't know, a woman wants to talk about running business like you, mm-hmm. okay? But she's, you know, maybe not ultra successful yet. Maybe mm-hmm. she's yeah just cracked six figures for the first time. I don't know, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, Well, you, you have to speak to where you are right now. I think a lot of people try to speak over their head Mm-hmm. And they are teaching something that they're just learning. And I think you lose credibility with that because people find out like, wait, wait a second. You're a money expert and you're living on somebody else's dime and you're actually broke. Like it th- 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 doesn't jive. What if you're just sharing it, right? Like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. That's great. I don't know how it's going to yeah. go. I think you just have to be an expert at the way you're doing it and what you're doing right now. Right. I don't think you should try to, I think too many people try to over inflate what they're doing and how they're doing it. And uh, you be just miss copycat. the mark. Yeah, it misses the mark. But everyone has credibility Yeah. for where they are. You know, like I, I met a member of your team today who I said, what were you doing last year before you were working for Ryan? He said, uh, I was in high school. <laughs> and I'm like, I freaking love that. Like th- that kid has credibility, like to come in here with that kind of confidence and to introduce himself to me and make conversation with me. Like that's a credibility that he should be talking about with his peers because that demographic, that age group doesn't know how to be social. That kid does. So he's got that credibility because he's he's doing it right now. So I, I think that we worry that people are going to judge us because we're not the best or the person who is the authority. And you don't have to be the authority. You just need to be an expert in the way that you do it. You know, and I, speaking of my team, you know, I I want them creating content too. So like one thing I tell them is like, yo, my credibility transfers through you, right? Because like, for instance, I think you're talking about Austin. Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, he's he's seen it firsthand, all the stuff. Now, is he the guy on camera and everything? No, he's not. Is he the guy who ran the businesses? No, but people want to know what he knows from what he's seen, you yeah. know, and experienced in the environment. Yeah, dude. I mean, like what he's gets to experience on the job. Yeah. I know moms and dads aren't going to want to hear this, but like that's better than going to any university. Like oh. he's going to learn more in a couple of months here than you would going to like the finest business school, frankly. Yeah. No, well, his dad works for me too, so he's fine. Okay. <laughs> so we got them both. But, uh, you know, it's funny because I saw that play out with so many of these guys that, uh, you know, we try to hire, right? So I remember we were struggling to find marketing agencies and finally I just took it all in house because I got tired of them all. And, uh, <laughs> you know, all of them have the same exact story. <laughs> I worked with Grant Cardone. I worked with Tony Robbins. Not only I, did they work with them, I, we built them. We did this for them. Yeah, like they were nothing before. Yeah. I, yes, you know, oh my like, God. Oh, really? And then, you know, after realizing I'm a gullible idiot, after going through it a bunch of times, I'm like, yeah, there's a reason you probably don't work for them anymore. Like that makes complete Facts. sense. Facts, yeah, 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 yeah. Facts, you know, it's one of the hardest things that we've taking encountered. credibility. Always. And it's, it's like my pet peeve. That's why I'll never take credibility or take credit for my student success. It's like, you found me, but you would have found somebody else. You've yeah. got greatness within you. Yeah. Like I didn't give you greatness. You, I, I might have been the voice that resonated, but you know. Finally clicked, but it was always in you. Exactly. And, and so you would have been who you are and as successful because that's what's inside of you. Mm-hmm. Um, but especially when it comes to building an online business today, dude, is so much more complex than mm. it was 10 years ago. Why? There's so many more, pl- like when Instagram first came out, you just tried to select a filter over a photo. That was it. Now Instagram alone is a beast. Instagram is long form video, short form video, going live, photos, carousels, reels. Um, and then there's TikTok and then there's Pinterest and then there's LinkedIn and then there's YouTube. And then there's uh, email list building and funnels and sales pages. And, you know, all of this, it just keeps getting more, I um, I don't want to say complex, but there's so many more layers to it. And when I used, like 10 years ago, when I started teaching people how to build an online business, most of the things you could teach them how to do it, you could teach someone how to build their own sales page. You could teach people how to build their own email funnels. Now there's so much for you to learn and you're the content creator. 
I think the real play is understanding how to find people to do it for you. Mm -hmm. It is changing people's mentality to understand like you're going to get there so much faster and make so much more. If instead of learning how to do all these things yourself, you learn how to vet the right companies, agencies, or team to do those things for you. Because yeah. you don't save yourself any money trying to figure out how to do it all yourself. Who, not how. Right. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Great book. Yeah. And even though I'm kind of like, uh, I just said the opposite with the agencies, like what else? Well, say not is, really. Yeah. Because you, you first used an agency to figure out what are they doing? Exactly. Okay. Then let's, let's, with that agency in-house and better exactly yeah i needed them to get started to just go and totally. learn and see what works what doesn't work learn how they think see how they run their operation and then build it myself yeah i'm trying to think of an agency that we've worked with indefinitely you know it just yeah. rarely happens because you you're learning exactly what they do how they do it their expertise and then you start getting a lesser result i find mm. and then i'm always like is it the agency what's going on is it the team now that's assigned to us yeah um and then we'll switch agencies and then eventually we figure out like okay we we should pull this in house i i believe that too but then i also believe that but it's not just agencies it's also just employees because the same thing happens with employees tell me about that what do you mean so you know, it's like you, you look at the U.S., the average um, turnover in the U.S. is like 2.8 years. Mm. So just mathematically. Do you know if that go has been going trending up or down? Down. Oh. Yeah. Because people are more transient. They're more willing to try new jobs and yeah. move. And, you know, there's more opportunities that they perceive to be available because of social media and you yeah. know, information. Yeah. So, yeah, that's going to keep going down. So turnover just as a whole in the U.S. is going to keep rising. Mm -hmm. And so and I've noticed that myself, right? Like as a growing company, um, you know, we got almost 100 employees and this this has been the most turnover we've ever had in a year. Mm. But we've also gone through a ton of changes where I'm like, I'm no longer going to accept these standards. You know, if we're to hit the next level of growth, this is the type of person we need. Right. That being said, you know, it's interesting because there are some people that have been with us for years. There was no issues or anything. It's just they wanted to move on to a different thing. Mm -hmm. They get bored. Sure. Life life happens. Someone has a kid, whatever. Right. Um, then there are employees that, you know, when the I forget what the saying goes, but, you know, 2023 is a tough year for many people, especially us, like in real estate. Tough yeah, year. yeah. It's like, OK, when things are good, they're good. But when things get tough, they don't they ain't as good, yeah. right? It just kind of reveals sure. what was always there. And then the third scenario is just simply like, you know, at the end of the day, you should probably never have hired them in the beginning. Oh, and then like, the worst. Yeah. You, you just realize it and you're finally like, all Too right, late. this yeah. is enough. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's to me now that I've been in business a while, like I look at it and I'm like, yeah, agencies are that way, but you know, a lot of employees are that way too. Well, then it's just a, a people thing for sure. Um, And you're in an environment where all they're hearing about is entrepreneurship. Yeah. Starting your own thing. Yeah, totally. Under. Yeah. So like it just kind of is what it is. Yeah. Um, and that's what I've accepted. And it's funny because a lot of people, you know, might go try and do their own thing. Right. Because that's what they're teaching and being taught, sure. whatever. Yeah. And then eventually they end up coming back. Oh, that's nice. And it's like that's happened on multiple occasions because yeah, we teach people how to do it. But let me tell you, yeah, it's still hard, you know, Le leading people, finding, hiring people is just such an underrated skill. I oh. mean, the the success of your business and the freedom that you experience in terms of your lifestyle is so dependent upon your team yeah. and, and hiring the right team. And having been in business with my husband for now, you know, 28 years, as long as we've been married, um, we've just learned to be better at it but man we've made a lot of mistakes <laughs> yeah. you know and when we make those kind of mistakes it hurts our bottom line but more than anything it hurts our lifestyle like i don't ever want it like the hustle grind thing is never really appeal i mean it did appeal to me for a while um and i think i became addicted to work i feel like i it was my go-to like I, all i did was work 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 mm -hmm. um and 
that wasn't healthy. It was, it was an addiction, you know, and I think we normalize that as an addiction, but it's just that addiction to hustle is just as damaging to families, to faith, to your health, your fitness as any other addiction, like addiction to porn or addiction to shopping. Like, but we kind of glamorize it. It's Mm -hmm. like, we'll even wear it as a badge. You would never say like, oh, I'm a... I'm a shopaholic or I, I'm addicted to porn, but you'd say like, I'm a workaholic and you say it like a, with a badge of honor. Right. Yeah. And I think that, um, because people don't know how to put the brakes on, people don't know, um, that it's not normal to always have to feel like you're on, right. That if you make the wrong hires, you, it's going to impact all of those areas. And so when you make the right hire, and you've got the right mindset, then it allows you to truly understand like the whole reason why I want to be an entrepreneur is for freedom. Yeah. But if you have, if you can't ever take a break, then you have no freedom, you know? And I worry about some of these um, young, very, very influential hustlers. That's what I'll call them. Mm -hmm. Who everyone wants to be like them, you know? Mm -hmm. But I'm older. And I'm wiser mm. and I, so I can be the bossy big sister and say, this is not going to go well. That ain't it. This ain't it. And I see everyone going like, oh, I want to be just like so-and-so fill in the names of, you know, whatever couples. But I'm like, what's a priority to you though? You know, like really what is, what brings you happiness? Mm-hmm. What is it that matters the most? Mm-hmm. And I think until you've hit a rock bottom, you don't really know what matters to you most. You start allowing all those like accolades and success to fuel doing more. Yeah. And then you're only as good as your last thing, you know? It's tough. It's tough. It's rough. Everyone knows that my favorite way to build wealth is through real estate investing. That's the reason that I started Wealthy Investor where we've trained thousands of students. But here's the thing. I've noticed that so many people fail to get started in real estate because they're worried about the money. They don't know where they're going to get the money to buy a house or flip or handle their renovations and things like that. And so they just never get started. I want to change that. And that's why I created a brand new free course that goes over five different ways that you could buy houses without using any of your own money today. And I'm going to give you it completely for free. All you have to do is go to wealthyinvestor.com slash podcast. I've made it specifically for you. The moment you go to that link, you'll be able to go get access to it and learn how you can start buying houses today without any of your own money. And if you're somebody who already has a real estate business and who wants to scale, we want to help you too. You can click the link below and book a free strategy call with our team if that's you. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point. The wealthy way exists. You know, I, uh, a lot of people started to ask me because I was public about it. I was like, yeah, I leave the office at five. I don't work the weekends and, you know, I'm still trying to grow and be successful. It's not like I'm retired. You know, I just right. try to make the most out of every hour I have in the workday. And then I want to go golf and I want to go on vacation. I want to enjoy my life. Yeah. What's the point of being rich if you don't enjoy it? Right. So, you know, I never subscribed to the grind culture and I've called it out a bunch. I'm like, dude, when these guys like Gary Vee and you know, everyone else is talking about do this and do that. You could do that, but the results are going to be not what you expect. Right. And now you're starting to see the results with a lot of these guys. Yeah. Bad health, bad marriages, this and that. You know, same thing with like, you know, uh, these guys who tell you, oh, dude, you've got it all within you. You can be, you know, the power. And I'm like, what do you think? Like, so you don't need God. You're just your God. You yeah. Know? yeah. So like, I, I really don't resonate with you know, guys like Tony Robbins and everyone else who says these things, Mm -mm. you know, and then, you know, that's, that's become my fight in social media as I progress through the ranks. I realize that I kind of need to become a testimony that, yeah, you can actually do it the right way. Thank you. And still grow and have a family and kids and make God a priority. And guess what? You know, everyone else is going to tell you a different message that that stuff doesn't matter and that you should just only grind and focus on work. But I see it behind the scenes. I know the truth about Good. how unfulfilled they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it worries me, you know, cause I, I have a huge community of people who are entrepreneurs and they see this glamorized success and they're getting advice from people who they don't like, they want, they want their life, but they don't know what their life is. They, 
they don't know what's really going on in the relationships. They don't realize that th- these people are giving you advice on how to do this, but you have children and they don't. Mm-hmm. And th- you want what's important to you may not be what's important to them. Yeah. So I, I think it's really important that people not get so caught up in how well known somebody is and see that as the moniker of success. Yeah. You know, when we were at the height of our um, business, we we had, you know, multiple number one fitness shows on TV. We had sold uh, one of our fitness businesses and we were just building and building and building. And I always felt like at that point, um, this is all going to go away. I'm only like I would get sick to my stomach the more successful we were because I knew that meant I have to do more than this next month, you know, and that took my husband and I almost um, destroying our marriage to go like, what? wait, what what really does make us happy? What, who cares? Mm-hmm. Like, who cares how much money we have? Who cares who knows our names? Like none of this stuff like I that's not important to me. And he's like, well, it's not important to me. And it's like, why didn't we ever talk about this? Mm -hmm. You know, we were just both going so hard and dealing with almost like triaging our businesses and success and not even ever even celebrating one milestone before setting the next one and the next one and always looking at like who's doing what and we need to do more than that. And it wasn't until like, we both were like, this is exhausting. And I can't even, I can't even sit and relax Mm -hmm. because I feel guilty. I feel like I'm not enough if I'm not doing something 24 seven that's generating income. And the only thing that matters is you and our family. So this has to change. Mm -hmm. And I don't care about the money. Like we can live in a shack, but let's fix this. Let's start over with our priorities in place and what really matters to us and nothing else matters at that point. And, and so let's make all decisions based on that. Let's make all decisions based on this one simple question. Is this in the best interest emotionally for our family? You know what, not financially, just emotionally first, Mm -hmm. you know, and that made saying no to things that in the past would have given me an ego boost and made saying no a lot easier. What, how many years did it take to reach finally that conclusion? How many years of the grind before? Mm -hmm. It was slow and steady um, pace to that. Like, you know, there were, there's so many signs, you know, you hear people say like, and then one day, but there were like so many, I think about all these things that happened where we should have noticed what was going on. We, we should have, had this conversation yeah. earlier. Um, but once we did have a conversation, then to answer a question a little differently, then it took us about three years to undo what we had done. Mm. You know? How many years though was like the slowness built up for three years to finally probably undo? ten. So ten years of kind of that mentality mm-hmm. of you know, you know, if, if I'm being honest, it was like my whole life, right? My whole life. That's how it operated. I and then it wasn't until I went to therapy that I realized where my work ad- addiction stemmed from, why I felt like I only way I had value why? is if I was making money for people. Where did it stem from? Um, well, so have you ever heard of EMDR therapy? No. So it's a form of therapy where you don't have to like talk about the issue or whatever you just pull up a feeling and then and i'm i'm just explaining this is from a layman's perspective (laughs) but uh and and so then you watch like a light bar and your eyes go back and forth eye movement your eyes go left to right left to right or you can hold on to beepers and left right left right and it kind of stimulates your left and right side of the brain i think and you just think about the thing and all these thoughts just come whirling through your head, like almost like in a dream. You know where, how when you're having a dream, things don't make sense. Mm-hmm. And you're like, wait, was I in the mall? Was that my dad? You know? And so that happens. Anyways, all that to say, as I was trying to figure out why I felt that way, I had a memory of my parents were entrepreneurs and my dad was a liquidator. So he would buy businesses when they were going out of business in Detroit. And this was like a really rough business to be in very cutthroat 
he and my mom took all of their savings and they invested it in um, a, a franchise that was going out of business and bought all the physical assets, had them in one giant warehouse and a competitor set it on fire mm. and they didn't have insurance. Uh, and I remember coming into my dad's office. He was sitting in a chair, much like yours. He had me sit down on a couch about position where this is. And he said, um, so you you know, your mom and I had the fire and we're going to be okay. Now here's your bank book. I think I was probably in sixth grade, fifth grade. And he said, Here, here's your bank book. And I'm, I'm going to teach you today how your money can make you money. Mm. I said, okay. And he said, so your mom and I, are, we're going to borrow your money and we're going to pay you back more. Now, Ryan, I don't know to this day how much money that was. I don't know if it was, you know, thousand dollars or five hundred dollars. I was, I was a kid. Right. So it was probably just birthday money. But that and it was him. His intentions were to teach me about interest. Great intentions. But in my mind, I formed the belief this is your value. This is your worth. You're saving your family. You're taking care of your parents financially. Not that wasn't true, but that was the belief I formed. Mm. And I believed then that was my role. That was my identity. That's what made me special. That's what made me worthy was that I could make somebody money. So it, was, it wasn't until I kind of like resolved that through EMDR that I was like, oh, wow. I am worthy because I'm a child of God. I don't have to make people money. I just am worthy. Yeah. No, that's that's an amazing story to share that. Yeah. Most people, from what I've seen, have never thought about, like you said, why do you even do what you do? Mm. And, you know, I talk a lot about purpose whenever we do these events and everything, because I always say, like, when the going gets tough, right? what's going to drive you to keep mm. pushing through and make it happen, right? Because if your purpose doesn't exceed the cost of the thing that you have to do, you will not do it. Mm. And so whenever I see these people who, yeah, I want to flip houses. Yeah, I want to make content. And then they never do it. The answer is simple. Their purpose just isn't strong enough to make them overcome the cost of doing it. Financially, True. time, you know, people talking crap about them, yeah. you know, whatever, right? And so... I've thought a lot about this, you know, whenever I interview successful people, I'm just like, what fuels you to keep going? Mm. And I think a lot of the people you were referring to earlier of the wrong thing to fuel you is simply a net worth, an amount of followers, a, you know, perceived success, a revenue, a net profit. Those type of numbers are the only thing that they feel provides them fulfillment mm. or um, worthiness. And then the reality is, and I, I went through this too as a baseball player. You asked me earlier before the podcast, like, hey, did you go through an identity crisis? Yeah, yeah. And the answer is yes. When I was playing, it was always a roller coaster game after game. You know, unlike football and stuff where you only play once a week, we play every day. So one day yeah. I'm the man. Oh, yeah. The next day I suck. Yeah. One day I'm the man. And so it's this constant roller coaster of like, well, I guess my life's going nowhere because today I struck out three times. Then you have the best game and you're like, oh, dude, I'm like the best baseball player freaking right in yeah. this, this city. You yeah. know, what are we going to do? And so you ride this roller coaster so much when you're 18 to 21 to 22. You realize you're like, yeah, dude, there ain't no way I can live the rest of my life like this. This doesn't work. And so, you know, as I've basically gotten past that and I realized that, yeah, my life's actually way better without baseball now. Mm. This is weird. Mm. I thought that this was the only way I was going to be successful or, you know, provide value to the world. But the reality is I've now learned after doing a lot of things successful that it's not the actual industry or the outcome or the niche or the thing that I am doing, but it's what's inside of me, which is the Holy Spirit and the foundation of which why I'm doing everything I do anyways, mm. right? And then once you start having this long-term mindset of like, hey, it doesn't really matter what happens day to day, because I do know that eternity is far longer than life here on this earth, you start to perceive problems, yes. success, and everything much differently. Perspective is completely shifted. Mm -hmm. Is there a 
part of being a professional athlete that helps you in what you do today? Easily. I know this is your podcast, but I have to ask. That. <laughs> oh, easily. I mean, everything that I went through as an athlete, you know, now in hindsight was preparing me for all this. But it's like, OK, discipline, consistency, dealing with fans booing and telling mm, you, you suck. Yeah. Competition day in and day out, you know, striving to win and be the best yeah. and prepare for a big moment. Right. Because, you know, you think about baseball, you get four at bats a game. Yeah. You spend three hours on the field to get four at bats and maybe a couple of plays on the field. You do all this preparation for just a couple of moments and you're like, wow, you know, I got to make the most of each moment. Yeah. And I, I think that's a great way for entrepreneurs to think about it, too. Like you, you are never going to be a a star player if you're not willing to practice if you're not willing to miss the ball if you're not willing to swing and miss right and i think that prevents so many people who are caught up in perfection mm -hmm. and are in that whole thing like oh people are going to judge me so they never put their stuff out there they just keep well you know there's a couple different things they either just watch everybody else and they consume and they consume and they never do anything with it Right. And, and but they think they're being productive because they're consuming and learning and paying for the courses, but never doing anything with yeah. it because they're I don't know what they're waiting for. I personally think those people are just being held hostage by perfectionism. Mm -hmm. Like they just they can't let go of that fear of failure. But I just you you have to make it messy. You have to fall on your face. You have to get it wrong to get it right. And you have to know that. You've, you've heard this a million times. You've heard this over and over and over again. So you either believe it or you don't, but you won't hear a successful person who doesn't say, I make, I had to make so many mistakes to get here. Yeah. And that's, that's part of what I was saying earlier, where the purpose has to exceed the cost. Yeah. Because those people who are still just consuming content or education or whatever else, for them, it's like Netflix, really. It's like, yeah. a, they, they feel like it's a productive Netflix. Yeah. But on top of that, they're still living life like so at some like they're doing something mm -hmm. and they're fine with it because yeah. whether they tell you they're fine with it or not, if it was truly unbearable, they would not be doing what they're doing. They would go above like, you know, as as, as I guess high performers, we have standards in our life and you as a fitness person. I don't know you that well, but I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that you've really never been fat mm -hmm. like extremely obese right because you have a standard you're just mm -hmm. not going to allow yourself to get to that point the moment you put on 10 pounds 15 pounds you're going to be like hey all right it's time right. to yeah. get back right you know and you just see that with successful people whether it's their business their health their relationship they're just they don't let it creep beyond yeah, yeah. you know just like this crazy thing but unsuccessful people undisciplined people it's like, yeah, my health's a priority. No, it's not. Look mm, at you. There's no yeah. way it's a priority. Yeah. I I do know, though, I, I know so many people who are incredibly disciplined, have such high standards but that that's the reason why they don't pull the trigger mm. because their standard, they they could never meet their own standards. Mm. You know, it, it's th their perfectionism, their own um, discipline just w will not allow for mistakes. Mm. And I think that's the deadliest combination. And these are the people who typically they come from like not to get all Dr. Phil or anything, but like these are the people who came from families where there was a, such a high expectation mm. that they be perfect and or parents who did everything for them. Yep. So the message was you're not going to get it right, yeah. kid. So let everybody else do it. That and listen, they make great employees that that's um all my asians in my asian culture yeah it's just like that asian mindset of just get straight a's and just do it and become yeah. a doctor but uh no it's interesting like the word standard is interesting now that we're talking about it because to me a standard would be like the minimum bar at which you are willing to accept in life mm -hmm. and you know as you said, maybe there are people who it's like, hey, you should start making content and they're starting from zero. Mm. And they're like, well, dude, I'm not going to make content if I'm not getting, you know, millions of views right away. Right. They just that's their perceived, I guess, standard for what makes social media worthwhile to them. Mm. But I would say 
what they lack then is the proper understanding of how long it actually takes to get there. Yes. Right. Yeah. Like, that's fine that that's the standard. But I mean, obviously, your first video ain't going to do that. So, you know, how, let's let's reframe the question. OK, I get that that's where you want to be. How long are you willing to not be there mm. while you keep making progress to get there? Right. And what are yeah. going to be the stepping stones along the way? Because you don't just lose 10 pounds. You lose one pound, two right. pounds, baby pounds. step this stuff. Yeah. You just have to start slow no matter what it is. And the, you know, to tie it back to our conversation earlier for th those people who are over 40 and they're looking at these like 20 somethings and 30 somethings who are like killing it and they're, you know, going, ah, oh, but killing I, it. yeah, exactly. Supposedly. <laughs> but they, and, and so they're like, I'm too old. I don't, I don't know how to create all these cool captions on my reels. I don't know how to use the apps. I, the technology is going so fast. You know, I, I can't even keep up. I don't even know how to use my iPhone. You know, I talk to these people all the time. I think in 2024, now you've got the advantage mm. because real raw content. I mean, listen, TikTok sets the trends. And if you look at TikTok, they're trending towards much longer form video content that is unscripted, that doesn't have the, you know, jump cuts, that doesn't feel produced, that doesn't feel scripted. It's somebody who sits down and you feel like they're literally, you're in their kitchen and you can see them actually press the play button. They didn't edit that out. They didn't edit out the breaths. They didn't put any captions. That's what I'm seeing as trending and, and the content's getting longer and it's getting more real and it's more storytelling. Mm. Anyone can freaking do that. Easy. And that's why we're seeing, you know, people who are older, um, you know, over 40, over 45. Like I think about someone like uh, um, Joan McDonald. She is the number one fitness influencer right now. She's, I think, 76 years old. Oh, wow. She started lifting when she was 73. Whoa. Dude, like that's sick. That is so sick to me. Like, I love that where people want real. They want they they want to see an older population too. Mm -hmm. You know, so th those people who are like, you're wiser, you've got the chops, you've got the experience. You just need to pick one thing and niche down on it first, right? Which is hard because I think the older you are, you've got, well, you're like, well, but I play baseball and I um, I sold cars and I sold real estate and I, I did all these things. So I want to talk about all these things. All these things make me interesting. That's great. But in order to get people's attention, you have to pick one thing and aim there first. Mm -hmm. And once people know your name, you can broaden your aim. Exactly. That's what I did. I started with real estate. Yep. Went broad from there. But yeah. I 100% agree. So, I mean, you're talking about trends right now, which is interesting. And that kind of goes along with why I love podcasting, because it is the longest watch time yep. out of any video. Yep, yep. And, you know, you've been on Instagram a long time, right? So you said originally Instagram was you do these just photos just and you photo. just get the lighting yeah. and whatever right and i remember i got on instagram in like 2018 mm -hmm. and back then there was like no organic reach it was like if you didn't get on the for for you page oh like, yeah that's right for you page you know like you couldn't you weren't growing so everybody was just buying followers and that was the only way to grow yeah and then reels came out and it finally provided this way for anyone to get seen and uh that was when I started doing well on Instagram and I was like, wow, finally they like allow a way for somebody to get out there. Mm -hmm. So what trends have you seen along the years and where do you see it going? I know you're talking about raw as, mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. a big thing. What are you seeing? Yeah. So Instagram is interesting. Um, actually all social media is really interesting. And I think we have to stop worrying so much about the metrics because we're, we're in a social media recession, mm. you know, what does I mean, that mean? It's just like any recession where there's too much supply oh, and low demand. Got it. Uh, do you know anyone who's like, I need to follow more people. <laughs> I need to consume more content. Nobody. Nobody says that. Yeah. Everyone is like, it's too much. I, I need to cut back. I need to take a break. I need to unfollow some people. You know, I'm sure you're like this too, where I, I will start scrolling. I'm like, who, when did I follow? Who is this person? Why did I follow them? You know what I mean? And because... I actually want to see certain pieces of content. I don't want the randomness. So all of us have less interest. We want more specific, really good content that does something for us. So the demand is much lower. And everyone, everyone has 
multiple social media accounts, right? Like yep. your mom has social media account. Your mom's on all five platforms now, right? So there's so much more supply. So of course we're going to see a huge dip in our engagement, our views, our reach, because there's less demand. That makes total sense. But it does a number on your ego if you're like, geez, man, a year ago, I was getting twice as many views and likes. So what am I doing wrong? And then we start manufacturing things that are Aren't playing true. to the, yeah. It's just the market. Yeah. It's just, it is what it is. So I think the, that's one trend. I think people just have to get their head wrapped around that. And then the other one I think is to um, get really good at just really being you and storytelling. You know, I think um, the less produced content is going to, um, I, th I think it's going to win. I think long form is, I think our brains are overwhelmed and we all feel this like, chaos like it's too much and you start to feel bad about yourself where you're just like scrolling and watching tiktoks and you said something earlier you said you know you can't multitask and watch a reel or a tiktok and it's true so i find myself like doing that and going like oh why do i feel so disjointed right now oh it's because i'm only getting like 15 seconds and i'll turn to youtube where I can spend an hour with somebody or 40 minutes mm -hmm. and I feel a little slower yeah. and I feel more connected and I can think through and process everything that you're talking about. And it makes me feel f more centered. And I think we're going to see a shift to that. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. You explained it in a way that I usually wouldn't say it. I think very, you obviously are like a much more feel and emotion based of like, dude, I want to feel like, we're just hanging out and like mm -hmm. you're with me and I'm just thinking tactically and logically and like the tactical side of my brain tells me that, you know, there's there's two types of way to consume social media. OK, there's actively and passively. OK. And so to watch a TikTok, you have to be somewhat active. Mm. And so with a TikTok, like the way I see people utilize it now is they're in line. All right. That's a good time to go watch a sure. TikTok. Um, it's a TV if they're watching TV, right? Oh, it's commercials. All right. I'll watch some TikToks. Um, I'm on the toilet. Oh, Lordy. All right. I'll watch some TikToks. Yeah. You know, like you have to like actively do it because okay. you can't be really doing anything else okay. to watch it. Whereas passive content would be like the podcast and everything else where it's like, Hey, I'm driving podcast. I'm working out podcast. I'm cleaning podcast. I'm going on a walk podcast for me. I'm hitting some golf balls podcast. Mm. So, you know, I'm, I'm passively listening because I'm actively doing, doing something, something else. Okay. And when That's you think about it, you know, there's the, what type of person do you want? The person who's, you know, doing a lot of stuff because they're active and they're got things going on in their life or the person who has nothing going on. And so they're just scrolling mindlessly. It's like, mm. dude, give me that mm -hmm, person mm -hmm, all day. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I like, I'm a big proponent of podcast and long form. Um, but yeah, like when I look at trends, it's interesting because I've only been taking social media seriously for the last, you know, three and a half years. It's crazy. And like, I look at how I got started back in um, COVID and I'm like, okay, my hypothesis back then during COVID was that everyone's on social media right now. They literally have nothing else to do. They're locked up. They're scared. They're just watching screens. I'm right. like, this is the time to strike if I ever was going to do it. Hmm. So I just went all in. And then the second thing I thought about was at that point, TikTok was emerging and there was no like real entrepreneurs on it. It was just yeah, kids dancing. You're right. Absolutely. So I looked at that and I was just starting to watch it because Gary Vee was like, TikTok's going to be big. And I was like, let me just see what this is. I was like, dude, this content's addicting. I don't even like right. watching content. And if I find this addicting, other people are going to be hooked. Facts. So... I got on TikTok during COVID and I literally, there was no agencies. There's no one teaching it. It like, it was so new. Right. I just started filming two a day. I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just going to yeah, try different things. And then sure enough, like all those factors led to, you know, the perfect moment in time to try and do something. Right. Yeah. But you know, over the years, like you said, the trends keep changing people's attention spans. What's hot mm -hmm. then is not mm -hmm. hot now, mm -hmm. you know, with the same subtitle stuff that you're talking about, I remember I did my own stuff in 2020, just on the app. And then one day I saw this guy post, his name's Ryan McGinn. 
good buddy of mine now. He posted the first time I'd ever seen those subtitles. Oh. He was the originator. Wow. It wasn't anyone else that's that cool. they think. And I looked at him. I was like, dude, that's cool. Yeah. And then I saw Grant Cardone do it. And I was like, that can't be a coincidence. I've never seen this before. Mm -hmm. So I DM'd Ryan. I go, hey, you know, do you do Grant Cardone stuff too? Like, wh what's the deal here? And he's like, I can't say. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, do it for me. <laughs> and I was like, that's cool. That yeah, like yeah, catches yeah. my eye. Yeah. So him and I, I hired him. This was three years ago. And I started getting content like that that you see today. Yeah. So, you know, he was the first. Cardone was the second. I was the third. Then he ends up signing Hormozy and all these other guys. And then it becomes the norm yeah, yeah. years later, right? For sure. And so now it's a thing where it's like it's just standard practice, yeah. right? And to your yeah, point, yeah, now yeah. it's played out. Yeah. So what do you do? What do you do? And I think that with any innovation, somebody is going to figure it out mm -hmm. and then it will be copied, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know. And then that becomes old. Very quickly. Yeah. Our attention span. You said something that I thought was interesting. You said um, an a active listening versus passive listening, right? Yeah. And I understand exactly what you're saying, but I also think that someone who's listening to our show right now, someone who's listening to a podcast where you're getting incredible knowledge, that person isn't passive. That that person yeah. is an active person, right? Yeah. So it's, I never take notes when I see like a TikTok or a short reel, mm -hmm. but when I'm listening to a, a YouTube or a podcast, I, I might be doing something else, but I'll always stop and I open up my phone yeah, and like give myself some to-dos, right? Send something off to the team. So it's, the, it's interesting. It's the long form that makes me feel like I have the space and the pause to be productive, to be to take action on what I've just learned or what I've just heard, yeah, you know, and I love that. Yeah, and maybe that's not the right phrasing, active versus passive, but. No, but I think the viewing is, right? Correct. Yeah, because you have to actively be viewing yeah. a, like a TikTok or a reel. Mm -hmm. But to take action, you have to have enough space to pause, process, and go like, what should I do with this? Yeah, well, I, like our attention spans, like we said, are, are worse now. So it's like, even if I'm watching sports, I'm on social media too. It's like we, we've now come to a world where you have to be doing multiple things at once. Nobody is content enough to do one singular thing. I know. Like, I don't know it's anyone that just watches TV or sports, no phone, nothing. They're just sitting there watching it. I know. And the same thing is true with, you know, if you're watching TikToks, it's because you're doing something, you're just waiting for something. It's not like, oh, I got an hour. I'm going to go sit on my couch and just watch TikTok. Like, that's not a thing. You're just right. You pull it out because there's nothing, you know, something's going we on. We can't be still. No. And even with a podcast, I don't think I have ever watched or listened to a podcast by just sitting there and watching it on my TV and nothing else. Like, mm -hmm. I, I turn on podcast every morning in my gym mm -hmm. while I'm working out yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. playing. Yeah. But and, and to me, honestly, I need to do that to like actively listen because like I get stimulated by doing something active, like working out or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But if I was to just sit there and watch, my mind would start like racing about other things. So do you have ADHD? I've never been diagnosed. Oh. I don't know. Well, I play a, a doctor on my podcast. So if you want me to diagnose you, right okay. now, I can just joking. <laughs> but um. Yeah, that sounds like an ADHD tendency. Just curious. Um, I find a lot of entrepreneurs have. I've heard that. ADHD. But uh, I mean, I'm embarrassed by the amount of time it takes me to find the right YouTube video to take a freaking shower. Like I, I can't <laughs> so just you're, take a you're shower. A, you listen into YouTube while you shower. Yes. So you can't even shower by no, yourself. No, I can't do any. So like, I'm not that I need bad. I can, shower, I can shower by myself. So right. I'm not like that. I'm not that bad of a heathen. <laughs> but look at you don't you know, we've got actually I have a lot of hair, but it's a lot. It's a faster process for a man to shower versus a it woman. Is, it is. So, yeah. But I'll still I'll waste so much time. Like I can't get in the show. Like I can't take a f I've spent 20 minutes finding the right piece of content to take a five minute shower. What is wrong with my life? You know, <laughs> but that's the, the world we live in. Like yeah. you have to multitask. And do you do think things. that your kids or some generation is going to have a complete 100 percent? 180 from where we are today where they like no social yeah i think everything trends right it's like we're all about it now we're anti and i don't know but like my kids now we can't eat dinner without them having an ipad i mean they're all yeah. under five and 
It's like, dude, if I tried to have dinner with that, without iPads and just let them eat. Your mental health would go down the hill very quickly. It's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just, it sounds terrible <laughs> to even try it. I understand. But yeah, I mean, it, it will be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. Um, because I think um, there is a loss of social skills. There's a loss of creativity. I mean, your generation is like the last, we were just talking about this day. Your generation is the last generation that actually like went outside and played, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And went to their friend's house for a sleepover or, you know, did imaginative things like built forts out of blankets. Like that doesn't happen anymore with these kids. My wife doesn't. Yeah. So we're going to homeschool our kids. My wife actually um, just told me yesterday, she was like, hey, there's this thing called like thousand hours for the year, like thousand hours outside. And they give you this, you know, blueprint of like, hey, these are the times a year, obviously, that being outside is going to be better. And, you know, during the summer, it's going to be less during the fall and the spring, it's going to be the most. So, you know, in order to hit a thousand hours outside, you know, here's how many per day right now we need to be doing. Wow. I love that. Mm -hmm. And it's got a way to measure it. What an important thing for families and parents to do because you just cannot underestimate what that does for kids creativity and um, development yep so it's gonna be uh hopefully she can i won't hit a thousand hours it's impossible uh unless i go get an outdoor studio and, huh. you know but so it's not just for the kids it's for the family well it's for the kids okay she's doing it for the kids mm-hmm. um so basically right now we got to get four hours a day outside with the kids wow so like that's Dude, that's heavy. I know because you think about it, right? 365 days. That's an average of basically three hours a day. So that is a lot. That's a pretty lofty goal. I I know. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. When I was playing baseball, it was easy. I'd be outside eight hours a day. Yeah. But today I'm in this office from nine to five. You know, I'm in the gym. I'm in these other things. So like there's no way I'm going to hit it, Um, though. It does justify me golfing more. So I'm like. (laughs) I'm down with it if we can go. You're like, I'm just trying to hit. I'm I'm just trying to get half 500 hours, right? you know? So, but yeah, you start thinking about society today and you're like, yeah, how would you spend that much time outside? Like nobody's, I mean, unless your job is outside, you know, that's gone. You're sleeping. That's gone. You know, you can eat dinner outside. Like what, how do you even get the hours if you wanted to? I think it's important because, you know, as someone who's also considered a health expert, um, we just weren't meant to be sitting. Like this is like the worst thing you and I could be doing. You know, right. we should probably we should probably reset the set and let's do a do standing a podcast. podcast or a standing podcast, right? Like, yeah, let's do a podcast on a, a elliptical. That sounds like a great idea. But we just weren't meant to be sitting and with our heads down like this all day. Yeah, and we're so inactive. I, um, you know, I wear an aura ring. And not a promotion for them, but like whatever tracking device you use is very interesting to look at your hours of inactivity. So <laughs> I had gone to the the doctor and you, know, you have to check off on the form. Like, are you highly active, moderately active, inactive? I would never hit inactive. But then when I started looking at my data on my ring, I'm like, I'm inact. I'm an inactive person. How could I be? I go to the gym and I kill it. I kill it. How could I be inactive? Because I kill it. And then I come home and I'm on my desktop. I'm on, I'm sitting, looking at my phone. I was inactive. Yeah. And it really was because I started looking at those numbers that it hit me. I'm like, I'm not an active person. Like I have, I can't consider myself healthy if I'm sitting yeah. Like 90% of the time mm-hmm. and not, or not doing something. So I switched to a standing desk. I Get now, a desk. uh, I have a standing desk and I'm getting a treadmill desk when we move, yep. but I basically use the treadmill, just walking on the treadmill. That's when I'm going to return my text messages, emails, okay. Asana team stuff. And it also forces me to get outside. It forces me to think, could I be doing something else other than sitting? Can I stand and do this? I should do like every Zoom call on the treadmill. That would be dude. That'd be the way to go. Yeah, it's remarkable how much better I feel. Yeah, it's it's made a huge difference. You know what else? My cortisol levels were cut in half. Mm. A fifty percent decline in my cortisol levels, mm. and I attribute a lot of it to just movement. Yeah, you know, sleep of course, but yeah, movement makes a huge difference. How often do you like? How many hours of sleep do you get? Like, what's your deep sleep and all that? Um, that's. 
interesting. So I had my brain scanned in 2015 and at the Amen Clinic. And when they pulled it up, Dr. Amen's like, I know what you do for a living. Um, but I have to tell you, this is really an unhealthy brain. Mm. And I was like, wow, that's a shocker. Because when I went to, in to have my brain scan, I was like, oh, this could be so exciting. They're going to be like, everybody come in, come in. We found a genius. Like, look at all the colors. And <laughs> She's got a 20-year-old brain. It's I was so, so excited. I'm like, this is going to be great. During the test, I fell asleep. Okay. So that was like, should have been my first time. Like, this is not going well. <laughs> And anyway, so they looked at my brain and Dr. Amen just kind of shot straight with me. He's like, we, you have changed everything. I'm like, that's when actually when I left the fitness industry mentally, I was still in contract, but I decided that day I'm never doing another video Yeah, because I obviously do not know what health is. If he's looking at my brain and telling me these things, I was deficient in almost every vitamin and mineral. Uh, my hormone levels were off my brain. He asked me if I had recently done serious rounds of chemotherapy or if I was a, a drug user because of the way my brain Dang. looked and it was because of sleep deprivation. Whoa. How many hours were you sleeping back then? Like three, four. Oh yeah. Yeah. So like how many do you sleep today? Now I sleep I seven, eight. Um, okay. Sometimes I'll do, I'll do a six, occasional five, but either way it's so much better. And because like last year, my push goal was to hit at least an 85% sleep score. Okay. Because so I, I, I knew, so when I set a goal, I, I want to set a goal that impacts, has a domino effect. So I usually don't set a money goal. I don't set a like, if I do this kind of goal or, or accomplishing something, I want to set a goal that has an impact on all my other goals. And yeah. so I knew like, if I get, if I'm getting that kind of a sleep score, that means I'm being much more disciplined with my time. That means I'm consuming less social media. That means I'm less stressed. Like that's going to impact everything. So yeah. I just set a sleep goal for myself last year and, that's awesome. and hit it. That's awesome. Yeah. But it's hard because I don't, I don't want to sleep. I want to do things. I want to think about things. I want to, I want to, I just, I want to be stimulated. You know what I mean? Like I, I had to force myself to sleep. Well, speaking of that, right? You're like, I want to do less social media, but your business is teaching social media. Yeah. So how do you balance the two of like staying up to date on what's working and yeah. trends and everything? You else? don't have to spend a lot of time to do that. You really don't. Very minimal time. Okay. And I also stopped consuming my friends stuff, you know, and, and, and just tell them straight up, like, listen, if there's something I need to know is going on in your life, I just want you to know I'm even my kids. Like I'm not watching anyone social because I, but I want to be there for you. So text me, tell me, yeah. send me photos. But like, I can't, I can't live my life and try to consume everyone's content. Yeah. So I, you need to spend very little time to know what's going on mm. trend wise. That's good. Mm -hmm. What about the business side? So, you know, you teach people how to obviously create followings and everything else, uh -huh. but we talked about just like the, the domino effect, but tell me like, okay, somebody comes to you guys. Do they already have a business and they're trying to use social or are you teaching them how to create a business? Cause they already, you know, use social and they need a business for it. Like, great. Which yeah, way so is both. It? Okay. Um, so one of our businesses, the avatar is someone who uh, doesn't have a business. They just want to use social because they want to make money. They don't have an idea yet. Like what that's going to be. Um, they think they do. Yep. They don't they usually don't even have an offer. They just know like, I just want more of, I want more cloud. I want to, I want to make money from social. Yeah. So we help those people. And that business tends to be a lead magnet basically for um, our marketing business where we teach people who two camps. So we've got a camp of people, they're all newer entrepreneurs. And then the person who wants to be an entrepreneur desperately, but is afraid to pick their thing. Yeah. They're afraid to pick the wrong thing. And um, so we teach them the right order to do things in. Yeah. Try to walk them through that process. What What is the order for somebody who here is watching? Well, first you, you have to know, like you have to start with the foundation. I think everyone's like, oh, I'm going to go to social. Or I'm going to start a podcast. They they go to the, the like amplify step first. But what are you amplifying? What is the thing? What is it you want? What is it you want to help people with? What is the one thing? You got to pick the one thing. You know, if... If you want to set yourself apart, you have to niche down from the start. You just mm. do. And people don't want to do that. And I understand. I didn't want to do that. I'm multidimensional. Yes. I don't want to box myself in. Yeah. What's going to happen when I get big? It's like, let's 
cross that bridge later. Yeah. I, and I rarely hear that. My, my bigger, more, more common complaint or I guess challenge is, but I, I love all these things and my followers love all these things too. Yeah, but they're not paying the bills. And like, if you want to be known, we have to, we have to double down on one thing and it doesn't have to be that big of a deal. It doesn't have to be the thing you're going to do forever. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't, it's not going to go on your tombstone, but if you don't pick one, you won't become known. I didn't want to pick fitness. Fitness wasn't my thing. I didn't study fitness. It wasn't the thing I was most passionate about or purpose driven. I just saw like of all the f- five side hustles I I'm trying to juggle right now, which one has a real opportunity? And I'm into, because I'm in, I'm into all five, but which one has the opportunity right now to make some money? And I need to double down on this. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I picked fitness. Um, And once I became known in that realm, then it gave me the opportunity to broaden my, my reach and to broaden my interests. But it's hard. And I don't think most people have the discipline to stick to that one thing long enough to see it through. Yeah. Yeah, the same is true for me in real estate. You know, I did not like real estate. It was like, well, I mean, I could do it for sure. And anyone can do it and uh, can make a lot of money. So let's let's try it out. Yeah. And then it worked. And I'm like, oh, well, I like the result. Yeah. You know, I, I may not really care for the thing, but I like the result. And then, you know, you do it enough and you do it enough and you start to like like certain aspects of it. And I'm sure there's other aspects you don't like, you know, I'm sure with fitness people from what I've seen, most actually enjoy working out. Uh, most don't enjoy dieting. Right. And so it's just like, there's give and take with every career path and, um, you don't have to like it. Like you can just do it and be really good at it. And then eventually, yeah, you don't have to like do it forever. Correct. Right. And that's part of your foundation. And I think that most people are so afraid they're going to pick the wrong one. Or let's say you've got, you're doing five different things and they all make you a little bit of money. You're in network marketing, that makes you a little bit of money. You're also in real estate, that makes you a little bit of money. You're also um, doing affiliate marketing, that makes you a little bit of money. So you're like, if I pick one, then I'm gonna make a lot less money. And it's a leap of faith. Yep. It is knowing that when you double down and become known for one thing, because let's talk about social again, right? So there's those viral videos that are just entertaining You never follow that person. It's just entertaining. Mm -hmm. And then there's that piece of content where you're like, this is really, this is really good. This is really helpful to me. You go and you look at that person's profile. And the first thing you do is you scan to see, is there more of this content? And if there isn't more of that content, they don't get a follow. You're only getting, because I don't have time for someone who's also posting what they ate for dinner and, you know, a picture of them out with a friend. I don't, sorry, no offense, but I don't care. So are you not a believer in people posting like other aspects of their life? A uh, great question. Yes. But where? Where? If I really want new followers, if I want to reach new people, then I have to give people a very clear and concise reason why they should follow me. Mm-hmm. So when you land on my feed page, when you like, let's talk Instagram or e- even TikTok, when you land on my page, I should be giving you more of the content that brought you there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then you, then I get your follow. Once I've got your follow, then you want to know who I really am. And that's stories. And that's that the live content. And that's the longer form content. That's when I, that's where I'm going to figure out, do I know, like, and trust you? And then I want to know all the things then nothing's off limits. Right. Because I'm going to relate to the your faith. I'm going to relate to the fact that you're a dad. I'm going to relate to the fact that you, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And, um, and that's where you have the ability to share all the different sides of you. Like when we talk about personal branding, you know, it's such a dumb term, really. We've over uh, complicated it. It's just, it's just, it's the parts of you that you want to be your reputation right? It's not all of you, but it's the, the things that are just a slightly different from everybody else, just a little bit different. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be earth shattering. You know, it just has to be just a little bit different. Right. Um, and you double down on it. It's like your hair is part of your brand. Yep. You know what I mean? It's, um, so I dyed it. I had never dyed it before. Really? Yeah. Oh, I was going to ask. It was just always, you know, my hair was always big and poofy. And so people, when I got on social media, they started talking about, it. I was like, wow, they like really, 
like that. I'm like, you know what? Let's just diet and really just right? see what happens. But see, that's a little tiny thing. Mm-hmm. Like to think about that. If I had asked you five years ago, like, let's figure out your brand. That wouldn't have come to you. You would no. have said, it's my hair. Like part of it is putting yourself out there and seeing something that you think is normal that other people are like, I love that you are real or I love that you, you're like your hair is amazing and then you realize oh this is actually a, a part of my brand mm-hmm. so I'm gonna give you an example in, in fitness there's a bajillion fitness trainers on Instagram um, but I recently spoke to a group of fitness entrepreneurs and I said to them big room millions and millions of fitness people on uh, Instagram I said who is the one person you think of when you think of glutes Mm. And they all said one name. They all know who the glute guy is, right? And it's because of the way he has branded himself as he calls himself the glute guy, <laughs> right? So his, his name is is Brett. I can't think of his, even his last name right now. Um, but he, you have to brand your, you have to tell people what your brand is too. Yeah. Right. You have to say it, it over and over and over. Yeah. Right. Like Muhammad Ali, I'm the greatest of all time. Uh, Dolly Parton, uh, I'm, you know, it costs a lot of money to look this cheap. She <laughs> calls herself a backwards Barbie. Like that's brand. You're telling people this is who I am. Like this is how you can tell other when you're talking about me. This is how you can describe me. Mm-hmm. So it's it's little things that you don't even don't sit down with a pen and a piece of paper and try to figure out what your brand is. Put yourself out there. And see what resonates with people. It's not going to be earth shattering. It's just those little subtle differences that make you memorable and stand out just a little bit from someone else who does the same thing. Mm -hmm. I have a saying that I kind of tell people, I'm like, you can't compete with unique. Mm. And so with that, it's like, okay, let's just take a generic career realtors, right? Dime a dozen. But what's going to make you stand out on social media? It's definitely not going to be you posting your listing photos all over your feed. Right. That's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Right. What's going to stand out is whatever makes you unique as a human, you know, who who is also a realtor, right? You want to display your expertise, but at the same time, you know, everyone's got these quirks about them that, yeah. you know, people resonate with. Yeah. And we, like I said, because we're in a social media recession, we don't want to follow more people. We, we are literally trying not to follow more people. Mm-hmm. So you have to make it such that when the person who's looking for you, they glance at your page, they're like, this is worth another follow. We're really stingy with that follow. You know, it's funny. Like there's gonna be people watching us right now on YouTube that watch your content all the time and they haven't subscribed. Why? It's free. Well, let me ask you that because we're now in a a world where the algorithm is so good that it's gonna serve you the content that it just knows you want, whether you follow them or not, right? Like on my Instagram and on my TikTok, I'm not on like the people I follow's feet. I'm on the, whatever, the for you thing. And so like, I get all these people. I don't know whether I follow them or not. Yeah, yeah, I really don't know, but I know who the people are, right? And so, you know, even the same thing, like you said, the podcast, lots of people who have watched this podcast. I mean, I could go look at the analytics right now and see that majority of people are not subscribed, are not following, yet they're seeing it. And so to me, this is like a more deeper question and I'd love to get your feedback. Do followers even matter, right? Like what is the KPI that people should be tracking? Your email list. Your email list. Okay, let's talk about that. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me, again, talking to entrepreneurs about like the order in which to do things. Um, Why go on social if you don't have a place to send them? You know, it's, it's like going out on a date and inviting a girl back to your home, but you have no place to take them. Okay, you know? so we're behind Target. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I got a big back seat. Um, I think, you know, the email list is everything. And um, uh, so when I'm creating my content, I am asked, you know, we have metrics, like 80% of my content needs to drive someone to an email list because my account can get hacked. Mm-hmm. I can lose it. It loses traction. If I've got someone's attention, the likelihood of my followers, right? So I, I think I'm almost at 800,000 followers. And I think roughly 4% of those who are following me see every piece of content, right. 4%. How, so 
if every once in a while there's a new person in there, I've got to make sure they're seeing something that allows them to be connected to me on a long term, deeper basis. And that's an email list, Mm -hmm. you know. So I think it's being far more intentional about how you're using social to provide your, you know, your true lifers with a who want to go deeper um, with the ability to do that and for you to stay in contact with them. How many people do you have on your email list now? Seven. Seven. Seven hundred thousand. Seven hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you know, we probably every three months just clean it out, clean it out, clean it out because it the val you know the the way that that email list performs is dependent upon people who are active on it. So it's it's a constant filling. Yeah. Constantly have to be filling that. So you know you run an eight figure business. So what percentage of revenue would you say comes from email? versus just direct social versus ads mm. very little direct from social okay the social is driving to an email list yeah. okay so um, social and email list kind of are intertwined a little bit mm-hmm. and i w- will also say to be fully transparent that the major our biggest source of income is our investments you know okay. m- managing investment portfolios but that was all made is possible that real estate or what do you invest in um a, a lot of different things. Um, not not so much real estate. I mean, we're pretty diversified, um, but that's all possible because of you know what we've been able to build online. But your question was, take it back. Um, you know, where would the revenue derive from? Is it uh, coming from the email list and you guys hitting the email list, email or is it list. coming from ads? No. It, well, and, and even an ad, we're very very rarely going direct to a sale from an ad. Um, so we're always driving to an email. We're driving to a webinar. We're driving to a freemium. We're driving to a free training. Um, so you're giving people a free lead magnet mm-hmm. to get an email. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then are you doing book of calls? No, um, because most of our stuff is, uh, I would probably consider lower ticket, like under $3,000. Got it. So we're driving to usually a webinar to sell. Um, and a lot of membership programs, again, lower tier And with those, it's a more like they really have to experience you in the way that they are going to experience you um, when they purchase. Right. So, for example, if we're sending them to uh, a course, then they want to see how I teach. They want to see how the other people or other experts teach in our um, different academies. And it is shocking to me. How many times I always ask this question when I do a webinar or training, how many of you, this is the very first thing you've ever purchased from me and you've been following me for more than 10 years cool. and it's, it's like the majority of people. That's crazy. Yeah. 10 years, 10 years. I mean, regularly I'll hear from people saying I've been following you for 15 years. I started doing your workout programs 15 years ago. That's this is crazy. the first thing I've ever bought from you. That's crazy. So that's why I always say like, I don't need today. I mean, everyone's different. So like, don't do what I do unless you're in my situation. But if you have a lot of followers, figure out how to get back in touch with them. Yeah. Figure out how to go deeper. Don't worry about like all the new people. Like there's so many people who've been there with you from the start. Like how can you re-engage? I love it when I hear someone say like, I've been following you for years and I haven't seen your content. Like, I don't know what happened, but like this is the first time I see, where have you been? I'm like, I've been here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you ain't seeing it, but I've been here. Yeah, and, and so, um, it's to deepen that relationship yeah. and and i want to just say to anyone who's like oh man it's just not happening yet persistence yeah just be persistent and patient because when they're ready if they trust you when they're ready they'll pull the trigger with you mm. so somebody needs if they're going to make content have a landing page to direct them to that's giving them something of value um, would you get their phone number too, or just focus on emails? Gosh, I wish I love, I love getting that phone number. <laughs> uh, what's your opinion on that? I find that I do a phone number on everything. Yeah. I mean, I love a phone number. I would be curious what the, if you make it a mandatory, how many people you lose from that or if people just put in a phony phone number. Well, I think the, the bigger question is determining you, you will have some loss, but how much is the gain from the mm. phone number? Right. It's like, I don't, I haven't like even looked into metrics, but I would assume a phone number is 10 times more valuable mm. than an email, right? So mm-hmm. I would have to lose. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I give my phone number on forms all the time when I fill them out. You don't care. Yeah. Right. But I don't get a lot of SMS marketing. Exactly. Yeah. But it's SMS marketing is a lot more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. But I think people also just 
hit their email list when they're launching something, when they're selling something. They're not they, like giving them value and no. treating it like content. Yeah, and, and really like truly nurturing and and then also cleaning your list, you know, mm. and letting people bounce come come back in, you know, if they want. I heard yeah. something funny from Cardone. So I was sitting there in his office and he was like, yeah, he was just showing us the back end and Grant, dude, that dude's never run back end in his life. So he's just saying things that they probably just told him right before that. Right, right. But he's like, hey, so we got like four million email subscribers. And like he showed his YouTube. To, he's like, dude, I would trade nothing for the YouTube. He's like, the YouTube is the best thing mm. ever. And um, he like pulled up his data analytics and stuff. And Dude, I think I remember seeing this and I could be <laughs> wrong. It was so funny, but like his ad revenue was zero. I was like, how do you not like turn on your ad sets? Yeah, you yeah. Know? Like you, you would have made millions just from that. Right? But, um, it was just it, funny. He just does not care. Well, either that or he's demonetized potentially. <laughs> well, but, but if he doesn't have his ad sense turned on, does that mean I don't know the answer to this? Does that mean then if somebody's watching one of his videos, they're no, not going to be served ads? Oh, really? Yeah. YouTube gets. <gasps> oh, duh. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Duh. So it's, just donate that money if you don't need it. It's so funny. Um, so it's just funny, like looking at how he does things. But yeah. he basically was like, hey, I want people to unsubscribe. And he's like, how many of you in here have unsubscribed from me? <laughs> I raised my hand. I was like, I've unsubscribed. You're mm -hmm. like, you annoy me with yeah. all these emails. Right. Yeah. And he goes, but look, guess what? You're still here. Yeah. And it's true. Yeah. It's like, dude, yeah. You're still gonna buy. He's like, people still always come back. They yeah, see they a do. new they ad, do. they re do. There's a new product, there's yeah. a new event. Yeah. And I, I was mean, like, wow. Yeah. I, I think probably one of the most important hires we made in the last couple of years is someone who really understands how to write email sales copy, which is very different from just copy copy, as you know. And and it's it's a skill, it's a gift. And I think it's just like social media, it's always changing. Mm-hmm. You know, and you have to know your avatar. You have to know what, who is she? Who, who is he? Like, how do they want their content? You yeah. give it to them that way. I think the toughest part now that I've done this for a little bit is, you know, you market and you get the emails and the lead magnets. That's great. But then, you know, what's your sales process like to convert? Because, you know, it's like, man, speed to lead is the number one thing that matters in conversions for me anyways. And so it's like, dude, if somebody submits on your list and they give you their phone number and, you know, right there, can right you now. touch them in five yep, minutes yep, or yep, less? Yep. Yep. While they're right there yep. thinking about the Thank thing. You. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a big mistake people make with emails, right? Because they've been taught, OK, when somebody downloads this lead magnet, uh, don't sell them right away. Like no. <laughs> send them like four or five emails and, and then tell them about this thing. And I, I disagree. They've like already if been I, watching your content for years. And if I've just <laughs> downloaded that thing from you right now, I've got the problem today and I need it solved. Yeah. So if you're not telling me you've got the solution, then you've just wasted my time. So tell me right now, even if it's in the PS. So we'll put it, if somebody downloads a, a freemium for us, the PS always has a, by the way, you know, I'd be a jerk if I didn't tell you the thing that you're struggling with. Yeah, we just gave you a little piece, but there's so much more you need to know and we have it. And here's how you, if you're interested, click here. And I think we have to stop assuming that people are ever going to open up another email. They're going to open up one email from you. Yeah. They're going to open up your comp. They're going your to open up a confirmation. Like 1%, That's it. You know? Like. Yeah. So tell them what you have in that email. Um, yeah. You don't have to hit them over the head with it. What but, do you, how do you get somebody to stop thinking that they can't sell, right? Because that's what I see from all these content creators. They're like, dude, I don't want to sell. My audience isn't going to like it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, one, maybe you conditioned them that way. So mm -hmm. like, now you got yourself a bigger problem. And when you try to start selling it, it's going to cause issues. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, my friend Graham Stefan, he's here in Vegas. Um, that's like one of the issues he faces is like, one, he doesn't even really want to sell, but two, he can't. It just is what it is. What do you mean? Well, he's had so many years of building an audience that is conditioned that, hey, Graham doesn't sell. He would never be a uh, sellout. And has that been part of like how he's built his reputation? Yes, correct. And he's promoted that too. Correct. Okay. So like that is what he is. Okay. Right? Versus a guy like Cardone or me. They're like, oh, bro, he's going to sell me. Like it just, it's all good. Yeah. Like yeah. I just know. Yeah. Um, even a guy like Hormozzi has that issue where he started to build yes. his brand around, Hey, I have nothing to sell you. Interesting. And now he does. Yeah. And so 
it's an interesting dynamic to see yeah. where he's going to take it. Yeah, I love um, explaining. So, you know, I, I've been on QVC selling things before. And one of the things that they have you do when you go to, Q, it's so fascinating. Like that home shopping network, like that's on TV 24 seven, like it is the science of selling and especially to women. And when you're going to have be featured on the air on QVC, you have to go back no matter how great you think you are at sales, you have to go back and go through their sales training. Mm. And their sales training, they teach you, don't sell, explain. The same way you would to a, your best friend. So your best friend who you know wants to buy the same car as you, and you're like, I, I love this car. This, you know, this Porsche is like my favorite vehicle I've ever owned. But dude, I gotta tell you, like the back seat, it kind of sucks. It's pretty small. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't say that if you were like the Porsche salesman, but you're gonna say that if you're explaining it to your best friend. Yeah. And that's called the anti-sell. It's like, here's the thing I don't love about it. And yeah. when you do that, I can then evaluate if that's a big enough reason for me not to buy it. And I trust you. Yeah, that's the main thing. And so I think if someone's afraid of selling, don't sell, explain. Let them and make then the decision. let them make a decision. And I, I love doing that on um, Instagram stories. So, you know, that's one place where we've had tremendous success. Um, not selling like necessarily our stuff, but like if it's someone I'm an affiliate for, I will I have a, a template basically that I follow on Instagram stories where I first ask them to relate to the problem. You know, so do you find that when you um, have even like one glass of wine the next day, you feel like crap, like someone's roofied you, like you're hung over and it doesn't make sense. Yes or no. Now, if that person says yes, then they're like this. I'm into this content. And the person who says no, I've just respected the fact that they can swipe through. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, then my next story template or the next story I'll post is I'll explain my situation mm. so they can relate to it. And I'll say, yeah, like I would have, sometimes I could have two glasses of wine, I felt fine. Other times I'd have one the next day. I just felt like I had done an all nighter and it didn't make sense. And then I started listening to this biohackers podcast and I learned about the difference in types of wines yeah. and how they're made and where they're manufactured. And then I discovered that like 36% of the population doesn't methylate. So if you don't methylate, which is very likely you don't. I don't even know what that means, but yeah. Is your body doesn't get rid of toxins the same oh, way. So okay. you literally are like poisoning yourself. And so it's not in your mind. Oh. You've combined like a probably a, a poorly made wine. I was gonna say, you just buying cheap wine. Yeah, but <laughs> they, in the US they don't have to, they don't have to tell you what's in the ingredients other than the alcohol content. Oh. They don't tell you if, if there's cyanide in it. There's, ca there's cardboard. Yeah, no, they don't tell you anything. <laughs> and so now I tell the problem. And then I provide the solution. So I would listen to this podcast. They talked about this wine company that um, only sources wines that are non-toxic. Oh. And, and, and then I tried it and no, I, no hangover. Got it. Um, click here if you want to know the, click here for the link or, or no, comment the word. I never do a click. Yep. Rarely do a click. Yep. Say so comment the, the word, link. use yep. a mini chat, comment the word so-and-so and, -so and I'll, I'll send you the info on this company. I love it. And and now I haven't sold you anything. I didn't even put a link in your face. Yeah. I just said, if you want to know, I'll, I'll send you a DM. Yeah. Your second question should be, okay, do you have this? Okay. Second question. Was the wine a twist off? <laughs> oh, it Did was. It come from a box. Okay. Never mind. Like we know the problem, but <laughs> exactly. here's, right? here's the solution. Problem solved. Yeah. No, that's great. I think it's super valuable for a lot of people. And I think that, um, you know, what you're doing is inspiring, especially like you said, there's there's so many women that are underserved. Uh, there's so many fears people have with, oh, I'm too old or I'm starting too late or this or that. It's just not true. Yeah. You know, you didn't miss the boat. There's always a new trend. Yeah. You can win. Yes, so. absolutely. It's never too late. They're looking for midlifers. Yep. They want people who are real. We don't relate to perfection. We want to see people who look like us. We want to see people we trust. So put yourself out there. Make it messy because that's the way, that's the only way you're gonna figure out what works. Yeah, where can people find you? Uh, I'd love for them to go check out the podcast. It's The Shaleen Show on YouTube or Shaleen Johnson. And I'm Shaleen Johnson everywhere else. Sweet, yeah. guys, go check Shaleen out. Uh, if you're trying to grow on social media, hit her up. She can help out and uh, hopefully you enjoyed this podcast. We'll catch you on the next one. Peace.
and subscribing is free. So if us talking you through, you being greedy with your subscription, like right now, subscribe to the channel and then drop a comment below and say, she was super bossy and I subscribed because she told me to. There we go. Subscribe. Do it now. We bought this building for $350,000, sold it, refinanced it, and bought this one for another $1 million. I then took the money and blah, blah, blah. I went viral within seven days. Many people might be thinking, I don't get it. Doesn't she sell home?